Welcome to another program in our series, Free Thinking Forum. And I'm delighted to have with me today my Senator Ron Latz. Ron, welcome to the program. Thank you, Bill. Great to be here. And uh, you have a tremendous responsibility in the Senate. Uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee Chair. Uh, what do you see as the greatest challenge uh, you'll face in 2016? Well, this committee sees almost half of the bills that come through the legislature because mm -hmm. of the breadth of our jurisdiction and some of the small provisions that can be in the bigger bills as well as some of the big provisions uh, in the bills. So we probably have the short session as our greatest challenge. Uh, we don't want to become a roadblock for bills that come out of other committees um, that need to get passed on. Uh, so we clean them up a bit and we send them on generally. And we've got some pretty serious policy questions that we'll be grappling with this uh, year as well. Yeah, what kind of policy questions? What, what's one of them? Well, I know that we're going to have a budget surplus. So there will be a lot of organizations, stakeholders, and, and uh, community needs for the portion of that surplus that would apply in the judiciary uh, and public safety uh, area, uh, such as uh, crime prevention um, especially, uh, prison population issues that we'll have to address. Uh, and in fact, the court has required that we address some of the prison population matters, have they not? Well, you know, the, the court is addressing the sex offender question specifically, and we're trying to get that to happen. We have not yet in Minnesota reached the point where the court is forcing our hand, but California has reached that point. So we know if we allow overcrowding to occur, at some point the court could intervene. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the law enforcement uh, body cameras. Uh, you were carrying a bill to regulate the data produced by police-worn body cameras, and many police departments across Minnesota have implemented pilot programs for their officers to wear these cameras. And I understand, uh, what, $600,000 grant to Minneapolis recently from the feds uh, to expand their police body camera program. What are the benefits and challenges to this technology? This technology can be really, really good for uh, the community's confidence in police, um, to hold the police accountable, and also to, uh, to rebut um, the claims of suspects who might be trying to get out of crimes that they committed. Uh, so it's really good all around. Uh, the challenges are great, however, because there's an enormous amount of data that is collected, the video and audio that's recorded, and that has to be stored somewhere. Uh, and then access when people make public data requests. Uh, that data isn't discriminating when it's collected. Everyone that's within the camera range uh, gets picked up on the video. Anyone who's speaking gets picked up on the audio. But some of those persons have rights to privacy. And so just turning over an unedited video or audio recording could violate their rights to privacy and could put some people in danger. So when there are requests for data, there's a lot of intense time involved in editing uh, to, or, or obscuring identities to make sure that uh, people aren't inappropriately disclosed to the public. Um, there's uh, just the vast amount of data is expensive to store. And the uh, State Data Practices Act, which governs public data, uh, determines that everything is public unless it falls into some specific categories of uh, private or non-public data. So there's an enormous task ahead of us. If we do it right, um, we can really benefit law enforcement and the public in this process. We had three hearings at the Senate Judiciary Committee last year, many, many hours of testimony. Uh, we revised the bill three times before we took it to the Senate floor and passed the bill. Uh, my hope is that this uh, coming legislative session in 2016, that the House will also uh, take up this issue we are going to have an interim hearing with the House committees that are involved, and we'd like to pass something uh, this uh, upcoming session. So it looks like you're working hard to make sure the House is more receptive uh, to these needed changes. Well, they had a lot on their plate last year, but this is going to have to be a priority. The Commissioner of Administration just denied the request for a temporary private classification of this data. So we're going to have to act as a legislature in 2016. Um, if police departments really want to make widespread and meaningful mm -hmm. use of this uh, potentially very beneficial technology. Now, uh, bonding is a big 
matter in 2016 too. Uh, what, uh, what are we likely to see in the, uh, in the prior, what priorities do you have to be included? Well, I, I've got a few. Um, in my district, which includes Golden Valley and St. Louis Park, I've got three bonding and, proposals. And a part of Plymouth. And a part of Plymouth, <laughs> and all of Medicine Lake, and all of Hopkins. Uh, I haven't received any bonding requests from those communities yet. Oh. Uh, but uh, I'm going to be I'm carrying the bonding bill uh, to uh, reconstruct the intersection, make some changes at Highway 55 and Douglas Drive. Uh, the Golden oh. Valley Community Center is also uh, requesting uh, bonding funds of the city on their behalf. Um, and uh, uh, St. Louis Park's uh, nonprofit organization, Perspectives, it has a bonding request in to uh, renovate and expand their family center. They do some great work taking care of, of uh, underprivileged kids that uh, need the extra guidance. Uh, in addition to that, I've carried the bonding bill uh, for Southwest Light Rail Transit every year I've been in the legislature. And my hope is either through bonding or general funds, will it be able to make the state appropriation to match the federal requirements so we can get that uh, line built. Good. Well, that's a big responsibility. <laughs> Thank you for uh, uh, get, get giving us the perspective on that. Uh, you're, uh, on, uh, you, the task force that you created uh, uh, very, uh, what was it, September, uh, mm -hmm. to go over our dire prison population projections, you've already mentioned the potential shortage of beds there. Uh, what, what did you learn from that meeting? Well, you know, we've got about 10,000 prisoners incarcerated in the state prisons at any given time. 10,000? 10, 10,000 in Minnesota. Wow. We are the, we actually do a pretty good job in terms of not over incarcerating, meaning we, we tend to incarcerate the people that really do need to be in prison to protect the public safety. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we now have 500 more people sentenced to the commissioner of corrections to go to prison than we have space for. And the projections are that uh, within about 10 years we're going to be up to a thousand people more than we have space for. So the Department of Corrections is proposing a 141 million dollar bonding bill uh, just for them to build more prison housing capacity. My hope is that we can evaluate if there are some places where we are incarcerating people that don't really need to be in prison to protect the public safety and maybe reduce the trend line there and avoid the need to spend that kind of money on new housing. Uh, we did convene a task force for that purpose made up of law enforcement and crime prevention folks, prosecutors, defense attorneys, um, the uh, victims advocates, uh, quite a wide range of stakeholders. Uh, and we're going to be looking for a wide range of possible solutions short-term solutions relating to uh, perhaps early release of individuals that have proven that they can uh, behave themselves um, but have already served some of their prison sentence, maybe some sentencing reforms in terms of min mandatory minimum sentences that don't need to be quite as strong as they are in statute right now, chemical dependency and mental health uh, treatment so we can stop warehousing many of the mental health uh, uh, people that uh, need help um, but they're in prison because of their mental health issues and I think we can do a better job with them as well. So we'll have some short and long-term issues there. I'm hoping that we can find a way to avoid unnecessary expenditures on our prison system. But where we do need to put people away, we're still going to do that. Good. <laughs> we, it, it's important to strike that proper balance uh, that you seem to be working on very well. Um, and. It, even though there's a short sec session, we uh, need to get that done before overcrowding gets uh, to be huge. Well, we're already spending money paying the counties to house the over 500 prisoners that we don't have space for in the prisons. Really? So it's an expenditure, and we need to address that one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should add that uh, the nation is reducing the number of people that are incarcerated. Most states around the country have seen a decline in their percentages. Minnesota, we've increased our incarcerated uh, percentages by three and a half percent in the, from 2013 to 2014. So our trend is contrary to the nation's trend right now. And uh, I'm pretty confident that we can find some ways to, to work around that. Maybe doing a better job of law enforcement is <laughs> leading to the higher rate. Now that could well be part of it, yes. And uh, in the last session, uh, the governor focused heavily on our earliest learners, the, 
uh, early childhood education uh, and secured additional funding from even from the reluctant house. But uh, are there any initiatives that you're honed in on to improve the educational outcomes and potentially reduce the achievement gap? You know, some of our best spent state money is on early childhood services, education um, and uh, parenting skills for the parents, um, identifying kids that are at risk or displaying behavior that could be addressed early on. Mm -hmm. And if it's addressed early, then by the time they get into kindergarten and into first grade, they're conducting themselves in a manner that is, is okay for a full classroom to be able to learn, and they are ready to learn as well. So getting that early recognition, early intervention is really important. I've carried funding for community education in St. Louis Park for many years. I've carried funding to increase, or bills to increase the, uh, the communica community education levy. And my son is a successful participant uh, now many years ago in St. Louis Park <laughs> Early Childhood and Family yeah. Education. It, we get a uh, 12 to 1 return on investment with early childhood. Uh, I think there's a broad consensus that we can do more in this area, that it's a fiscally responsible thing to do. And I suspect with the state having some additional funds available, we'll be able to do some real good funding for that in good. the next legislative session. That's, that's quite a payoff. You, uh, you spend $1 and get $12 in return. It's worth it. The problem is you don't see that return instantaneously showing up in your budget. <laughs> so you've got to make the investment yeah. um, and, uh, and just hope not really hope. The studies are pretty clear that it works. Well, I've, I've heard a figure as high as 16 to 1 uh, for the payoff on early childhood education. Yeah, but we've got to take it out of our budget at the beginning now. And that's where people get reluctant. Those who are really watching our dollars carefully say, well, we don't have the funding for that. We've got to spend our money on uh -huh. higher priority items. And from my standpoint, there can be no higher priority item than yeah. uh, early childhood education um, and uh, that prevent. Help, helps keep, keep people out of jail. It keeps them out of jail. It, it helps them get better educated. They can get better jobs, be more productive yeah. uh, taxpayers. And, and uh, uh, we're all better off if, if they uh, get that early intervention. Yeah, now, um, I'm, so I really am a fan of that early childhood education, as you can tell. Uh, there are some other things you've been working on. You worked on the expansion of the Ignition Interlock in Minnesota, a program that's proven to reduce drunk driving and increase public safety. Uh, additionally, it was fully supported by Mothers Against Drug, Drunk Driving, the MAD, and others. Uh, where do you see the need for further expansion of this program? Well, I, I would like to see it expanded into uh, commercial vehicles. I mean, oh, yes. Ignition interlock, it's an electronic device that you install in the car and, and the driver has to blow into it to make sure they don't have any alcohol in their system before the car will start. So right now we use it for repeat drunk driving offenders and for those who have a very high test result, more than twice the legal limit. Um, and it's been statistically proven around the country that it helps prevent drunk driving. Uh, but it's a problem in commercial vehicles too, isn't it? Well, the drunk driving itself is not really a problem in commercial vehicles. You don't see very much of that. Uh, but the problem is if you lose your license from driving in your own private uh, individual vehicle, you lose your license to drive your commercial vehicle as well. So mm -hmm. if you're a truck driver or if you drive a step van around or if you drive for an employer to do things, um, it's harder to keep your job or you get fired because the insurance company won't insure the employees if you've got a DWI on your record and you're driving for the company. So I'd like to see the employers be able to put ignition interlock devices into their commercial vehicles, enable their employees to keep working. The fact is, when people lose their license, they end up having to make a choice. Either they will drive illegally so that they can keep their job, and they can pay their rent or their mortgage, they can put food on the table for their families, uh, or they will drive with the, uh, legally with ignition interlock. We'd like to see them in the ignition interlock program because that's safer for people than having them drive illegally without insurance, without a valid license. That sounds very sensible, <laughs> very, very needed. <laughs> uh, now, one of the things uh, that I've seen uh, an issue is, uh, do you see the voter re restoration 
uh, that is allowing those to vote when they return to the community from prison, is that once again a major issue in, in 2016? Yeah, I think it will be. We pushed really hard in the Senate this year and we passed a bill to restore the rights of persons who have been incarcerated for a felony to vote once they have left the prison and returned to the community. We want them to be successful when they've left prison and almost everyone who gets sentenced to a prison term comes out eventually. They are more likely to be successful if they feel a part of the community and have a stake in the community when they re-enter. That means easier to get a job, uh, that means reintegrate with their families, and that means setting an example for their children to participate in the community affairs. The most fundamental way of participating in the community is to vote. We think, and the studies show, that they're less likely to re-offend if they have the right to vote at that time. And if you think back to the American Revolution, part of it was over taxation without representation. The colonists were not allowed to vote on whether or not they could be taxed. Well, if these people have served their time in prison, come back into the community, they get a job, they're paying taxes on their income, they're paying sales taxes when they buy things, but they're not allowed to vote on the representation. There's something fundamentally wrong about that in our democracy. Yes, uh, and there are other states, I think North Dakota for one, that as soon as the uh, person is released from prison, even though they're on probation or parole, um, they, they can vote, they can register to vote right away. That's correct, that's correct. You know, there was a time 150 years ago uh, when there was a, just a tiny, tiny fraction of the, of the worst criminals that ended up in prison, and it really wasn't an issue. But we now have a lot larger proportion of people um, in Minnesota who have come out of prison, they're back in the community. We want them to be successful. We are all safer if they are. Yeah, and uh, the ban the box was successful, uh, I, I gather. Would you explain that to the audience, is there? Sure, I, I carried the, uh, the pilot, uh, the initial ban the box legislation that applied to government as an employer. It's now been expanded to include almost all private employers. Uh, there's a box, or used to be a box, on a lot of employment applications that an applicant would have to check if they had a criminal history. And what often happened then is anytime that box was checked, a potential employer throw would just up. throw it away. They'd yeah. never even look at the qualifications of the individual. Made it really, really hard for people to try to get a job once they came out of uh, prison um, and, uh, or have any kind of criminal history, even if they never served in prison. Uh, so the bill, the law now, requires that there not be that box on the application. So people can at least get through the first review, the employer can take a look at their qualifications, see if they have the right, otherwise, right background and criteria, it can be a uh, help to that company. And then, uh, when they get to the interview stage, uh, they can have an opportunity to explain what they feel they'd want to explain about their history. Um, and it's not saying that the criminal history can't be taken into consideration. It absolutely can factor into an employer's decision to make a hire. Uh, but what it is, it is saying is let them get the first foot in the door, have them <laughs> considered on their merits, mm -hmm. and then the employer can make a judgment based on the overall package, not on a prejudgment of, of one criterion. That sounds very sensible. <laughs> well, and again, it, it helps and those who have criminal histories get jobs, which helps them not reoffend. Makes us all safer. Thank you for leading the way uh, in the initial stage of banning the box from the uh, government uh, work applications. Thank you. And uh, 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 is there anything in the 2016 elections that issues that do you see issues being tabled out of fear of electoral ramifications? Well, uh, one of them might be that uh, voter registration issue. Uh, one of them could be the DWI ignition interlock reforms. We had a really comprehensive package last year for DWI reforms, um, supported, much of it supported by Mothers Against Drunk Driving and Minnesotans for Safe Driving. And the politics get in the way of that sometimes. Um, in a legislative session during an election year, uh, everyone's antenna is going to be a bit more sensitive. It is really my hope that legislators who are elected to make serious policy are willing to make sometimes tough decisions and vote for bills, vote for changes in statute that will have long-term benefits to mm -hmm. all of our communities 
and not be quite so attuned to the political winds or the fear that an opponent somewhere will use a literature piece to, to bash them over votes that really are uh, good for the community. Yeah, there's so many distortions in, in uh, uh, attempts to, uh, to, to uh, make, make a vote appear to be much worse than it really is. Uh, is there some way to <laughs> reduce that? Uh, well, you know, that's the nature of democracy, and we, we can't really uh, stop the free speech of political voices, whether yeah. it's coming from a candidate or from other citizens or entities that are participating in the process, except that there are restrictions on, on uh, truthfulness. You, you can't lie outright about things, Good. Uh, which is appropriate. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, you don't want to restrict free speech, no. uh, but, you know, there has to be an opportunity to, to uh, be heard, the candidate to be heard also, and sometimes their voices can get drowned out. The worst, however, is like uh, with the expansion of the Ignition Interlock program. We had a proposal last year to expand it, um, and uh, it, it got shot down because people were afraid that it was going to be used in the next election against them. Mm. Um, and. Uh, things like that, when you know the, the statistics support its safety, um, we're all safer if we expand the use of the program. But it's such an easy issue to demagogue, to accuse someone of being soft on crime because they voted one way. You never get a chance to explain it if all you see in the brochure is the accusation. Especially if there's undisclosed uh, funders of, of the advertising. Uh, do we, can we do anything about that? Well, you know, yeah, and that hasn't really happened in the ignition interlock area, but you're right, in a lot of other areas, there are corporations that, because of U.S. Supreme Court decisions, can get directly involved in campaigns, can spend all the money that they want. They don't have to disclose. As, as though they're a person. Uh, as though they're a person, and other organizations can take private donations from individuals without disclosing who those individuals are, give themselves a name that sounds real good, and then spend a lot of money in a campaign to try to defeat a candidate or get a candidate elected. Uh, and uh, we don't know who's putting up all the money for it. Uh, these are some decisions of the current uh, conservative United States Supreme Court that has opened up these funding opportunities. And I think that's pretty bad for democracy, actually, yeah. because we don't know who's speaking. Right. Uh, I think we have a right to know who's behind these campaigns that. Uh, denigrate uh, the work of legislators. You know, there was, uh, uh, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a corporation that um, has an industry that tends to pollute and they're advocating for, you know, a certain candidate, and you might think again um, about what they have to say if you know that they're motivated by the self interest of not having as much environmental regulations apply to their industry. So we can't make an informed decision without knowing who's paying the bill. And what I'd like to see is that we know who's paying the bill. Yes, I agree. Uh, I, I hope, uh, can we do anything at the state level in that regard to requiring well, disclosure? Well, uh, our hands are a little bit tied now because of what the U.S. Supreme Court has said in defining corporations as persons, for example. <laughs> uh, we do have some things that we can do. We've tried a little bit uh, at the legislature uh, but mostly I think the public is going to have to demand that they know who's behind the literature pieces. And the media has a responsibility to do some digging and to help the public find out about that stuff and to disclose it. Absolutely. I hope we have not only courage in the legislature uh, passing some of these bills that we've been discussing, but also courage in the media to uh, Agreed. Uh, ferret out what these, uh, who's behind some of these uh, camp, attack campaigns. So uh, there's one, another issue in the Judiciary Committee, I understand. Uh, uh, why is Minnesota declining to participate in the federal real ID driver's license system? Uh, do you think the legislature will reverse this uh, this year? Yeah, I think we are going to have to. Um, the real ID requirement, basically it's a more robust identification uh, system like a driver's license uh, to help prevent uh, terrorists or people that we think are threatening to the public safety from, for example, getting on airplanes 
um, or, or getting into secure facilities. The federal government passed the requirement uh, a few years after the 9-11 attacks in response to the 9-11 Commission's recommendations. And they required the states to comply. Right now there are four states that have refused to comply, have been very leery of having this additional information on their driver's licenses because of fear that that additional information um, can be used in ways that aren't only about protecting the public, but that invade our privacy. And those are legitimate concerns. But there have been challenges to it. There have been attempts to change the federal law on that, and Congress has not changed it. Um, mm -hmm. They continue to keep the law in place, and Minnesota's hand is about to be forced into action. Uh, Minnesota actually passed a law saying that we would not comply with mm -hmm. the federal requirements, but it's getting but Congress the, didn't listen. Congress didn't listen. So ultimately, the federal government has the authority over this kind of thing. They can tell us that we can't access federally regulated transportation like commercial airplanes. So if you have a passport, you can get on without any problem. If you have some of the special driver's licenses, uh, which enable you to get into Canada, for example, uh, without having to show any additional identification, um, then you can get onto airplanes. But next January, the federal government has, has said, if you just have a regular Minnesota driver's license and nothing else, you're not gonna get onto a plane. So January 1, 2017, you better have a real ID yeah, or actually a passport. Yeah, actually they're saying it's 2016. Oh, really? Yeah, so that's the governor has made mention of a special session to address this. I suspect if, if we show some real serious effort uh, an indication that we're going to get on board with it, that uh, the federal government would be willing to give Minnesota a waiver until we get through our regular session to address it. Well, uh, we But it's not a waiver for a, a short period of time so we actually do deal with it. I think we're not going to have a choice, frankly, but to pass uh, the real ID legislation. Well, the next session starts March uh, that, 8th. That's yeah. a long time. Uh, it's a long time in there, and uh, you know we don't usually pass bills in the first week of the session. We like right. to have hearings and, maybe and have that, debate. Uh, maybe we do need this special session. <laughs> we might need to, and, and uh, you know if the governor calls it, we'll certainly uh, take care of it at that time. I'm part of a, uh, a group working on this uh, with a couple of other senators and representatives and the governor's office uh, trying to come up with a solution here. Good. Well, Ron, I, uh, we've got less than two minutes left. Is there anything else you'd like uh, people to know? Uh, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to serve in the Senate. Uh, I'm honored that my colleagues have, have uh, uh, confidence in me to chair the Senate Judiciary Committee. You know, I also serve on the Commerce and, and Consumer Protection Committee, uh, which is a very important place for me to be. It, it helps us balance the commercial interests of businesses uh, with the protection of consumers in Minnesota. Uh, and I serve on the uh, uh, on the uh, full finance committee because the Judiciary Committee is both... And you're chairing the ju Judiciary Subcommittee there, aren't you? That's right. Uh, my committee is one of the committees that is, uh, is, is both. It's a Judiciary Policy Committee and it's the uh, Finance Committee. So we, oh, it's the same committee. So it's the same people, but technically we are separately <laughs> a division of the full Finance Committee. Yeah. But in budget years, uh, we provide the, uh, the funding decisions for the, uh, the courts, for the Department of Corrections, where all the prisons are, and the community probation and parole officers, for the Department of Human Rights, for part of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, so we've got a lot of work um, under our committee's jurisdiction, but those aren't my only issues uh, that I deal with no. in the legislature. So it's a pretty, pretty exciting time to be there. It sure is. It's so good to have you with us, uh, Thank Ron. you, Bill. And uh, thank you for tuning in for this uh, program looking at the judiciary of the state legislature. Thank you. Thank you.